Let's see. How's the internet working tonight? Internet? You can do it. Let's see. All right, looks like we're working. So today I'm gonna be discussing bullying. Now I discussed bullying in an older video about, I think it's almost two or three years old now. And that video didn't necessarily deal with the beginning of bullying. That video dealt with uh, not allowing other people to control or manipulate your emotions because that is how bad people win. Bad people win when they get you to manip they get you to take negative action that makes you then feel bad about yourself. And I use the example of a longtime bully that made fun of a mental illness of somebody in my family that I then pushed down a flight of stairs about five years later when I went from being you know uh, 83 pounds to like 130 or 140 pounds, and it was a lot easier. But tonight, but tonight I wanted to focus a little bit on where the bullying begins and I wanted to move the sense of personal responsibility and accountability away to the person or the cat. The cat. Why do you have to be on the table now? The person that typically deserves it. So one of the largest misconceptions that I find is that bullying is caused by somebody being weird. Bullying is caused because you are weak. Bullying is caused because you look funny, because you wear something that's th that, that, that you're not supposed to be wearing, because you know may maybe you're not good at sports. People often internalize the reasons that the bullying occurs rather than looking at much of the external factors. And I find that there is this false dichotomy between there's a false dichotomy between being introverted and being weak. There's a false dichotomy between being weird and being weak. And as you get older, you start to realize that that's not the case, but very few people will actually backtrack and, and think back to their childhoods and think about why they're bullied. If you go to places like just Williamsburg, uh, Williamsburg or Bushwick in New York, you'll realize that there are a lot of weird people with weird hair colors and weird piercings and weird clothing and weird ways of talking that don't have to deal with bullying at all. And you'll also notice that if you look really closely, there is a difference between an introvert and somebody who gets bullied. Being an introvert, not wanting to talk to every single person that you meet, uh, having a funny hairdo, being three inches shorter than the rest of the class, these are not the reasons that you are bullied. Having something weird in your backpack, these are not the, re the reasons that you are bullied. And the thing that makes somebody bullied is not being an introvert, but rather it's the, it's the ability of a bully who is a predator to detect a trait in you. And when I say predator, Predator, I mean this in the realest sense of the word. In the wild, a predator is going to look for weak prey. When you hear about people, just imagine a robbery. Imagine that a imagine that a robber has a choice between two different targets. They have a choice between a target that is. Um, let's say they have a choice between a target that's walking around like this, and they have a choice between a target that's walking around doing this. Which one are they going to go for? On average, the thief, the predator, is going to go for the easy target. They're going to go for the person that is unable to protect themselves or that has nobody else protecting them. They're not going to go for the person that is vigilant, even if that thief has a knife, even if that thief has a gun, even if that thief has a, um, is far more buff or built or just you know knows martial arts, even if that thief could kick that person's ass, on average, the predators are always naturally going to go for the easiest prey. So what is it that makes a bully, what is it that, that uh, tell, signals to a bully that a child is going to be easy prey? What signals to a bully that a child is going to be easy prey is the fact that there is nobody to protect them. It's not that you're an introvert. It's not that you're two inches shorter. It's not that you watched Barney instead of watching Power Rangers or whatever the fuck it is. It's the fact that you are alone. And I don't mean alone as an introverted. I don't mean alone as in I prefer to be by myself. I mean alone as in you can sense an anxiety around that child. You can sense that they are just uh, in a state of constant isolation and fear. And I want to talk about where it is that this sense of isolation and fear comes from. Because you have to think about this. Is a bully going to target somebody who has people to protect them? Is a bully going to target somebody who is likely to tell others? Or is that bully going to target people that where there are no consequences. On average, the bully is going to want to pick on somebody to whom there are no consequences. And the same is true when it comes to, uh, to things like sexual assault. As, as sick and disgusting as it is to think about, it is something that we should delve into while we're on the topic of bullying. When it comes to, um, excuse me. Almost done. 
When it comes to topics like sexual assault, on average, pedophiles and predators, uh, they, they, they choose victims from vulnerable families. They choose victims that have, uh, that have parents that are always away. They choose victims that are disconnected from their parents. They choose victims that have a bad relationship with their parents. They choose victims whose parents are almost never home. They're always out, whether, it's at, whether they work all the time because the parents are poor and they gotta work 16 hours a day to support the household, or whether they're just a bunch of rich assholes that wanna be at the yacht club all day. They pick kids who are alone and isolated, who are not going to tell other people, who have weak relationships with the core family in their life so that they don't have to worry about that core family telling other people. And the same thing that, is, that, same thing that holds true in cases of pedophilia and sexual assault often holds true in cases of bullying. What a bully is sensing, what a bully is sensing when it looks at a person that they're about to pick on is that what they sense is they don't pick up on the fact that you're wearing funny shoes, they don't pick up on the fact that you're poor, they don't pick up on the fact that you suck a kickball, they pick up on the fact that you are truly isolated from the world, that you're, you do not have well-built core relationships. And this is something that I went over in the parenting video, the video uh, that got a lot of comments from crappy parents called uh, Don't Scream At or Around Children. And in that video, I touched upon the concept that kids have this razor sense, they have this, this very accurate sense of whether or not they are a burden. Children do not wish to be a burden on their family. They don't wish, they, they, they don't want to cause conflict. When a child comes home, if they sense that the home is unstable, and they can sense this, even if you don't, even if you stop yelling the moment they open the door, they can sense in the air that tension. They are not going to come to you with their problems. They're not going to come to you with their feelings, their emotions, their issues, and they are not going to seek your help in resolving those issues. So if you have a household which is constantly filled with, with tension, if you have a household that is constantly filled with some level of despair, even if you go and look at your kid and go, how was your day today? How did you do at school? They're going to sense that five minutes ago you were screaming and losing your mind, and they're also going to sense that if they bring up something that is difficult to handle, that you're not going to handle it well, that you're not going to respond well, that you are going to respond with blame, or you're going to respond with, um, with, uh, with just type of generic crap and that you're not, hmm, more alcohol. That you may respond by blaming them, that you may respond by saying something, something dismissive just to, get, uh, just to get rid of the issues so that you can go back, back to watching Oprah or arguing with your husband or wife. Like um, something along the lines of, did you try making friends with him? And then going back to the television. Uh, so they're not going to bother. And that happens particularly in households where the parents scream at the kids. This also happens in households where the parents, for whatever reason, should not have been parents at that particular point in time, like <laughs> single parents, uh, and that uh, happen to have sex too early or have sex without thinking about it, that have then put themselves in a very unstable condition in an unstable home for the child. So now the kid senses, he has this sense that this person has worked 12 hours and when they get home, they don't want to listen to my shit. And they're not going to want to listen to me talk about how that kid pushed me into a wall today. So that kid is going to keep that to himself. And that is going to manifest itself in the form of stress and anxiety that is going to be very, very obvious to all of his peers. His peers are not looking at him saying he's an introvert. Those peers, those predators, are looking at that kid like, he has nobody to run to. He's not going to tell his parents. And they don't, and this is instinctual, very instinctual. When people are five and six years old, this whole thought process doesn't get gone through. This is a very, very instinctual thing that they, that they pick up on. That kid is not going to tell his parents that he's being picked on. That kid is not going to tell anybody because he doesn't have those core relationships for whatever fucked up reason. So his, he, his parents are never going to instruct him on how to deal with it. His parents are never going to run to the teachers and the principal and demand that something get done about it. They're never, he doesn't have friends that are, going to, that are going to help him with this issue because he knows that in his life, all the people that are supposed to serve as a support system, he actually has to support them. The kid has to support his parents' emotional weakness. The kid has to support the fact that, that has to live with the fact that those parents never wanted him. So he has to deal with all of this crap, which means that he is not going to, he or she, is not going to try to add to their burden. It, it, and it's one of these things that you particularly see in, uh, in the single parent households where you, like, you just say something like, hey, you have five minutes, yeah, you have maybe 20 minutes to talk, and it's like, um, you know, I, I mean, I always want to talk to you, little, little Ronnie, but it's like, I just got home from work, and I had a really stressful day, it was like 10 hours, and Rhonda was really riding me in my ass today about the reports, but I'll talk if you want to, but, 
You know, we had a, and then we had, we had to meet this deadline, and this deadline had to get met, and I had to stay for an extra two hours, and I was just about to watch TV, but I, but I really, I don't want you to feel like I don't want to talk to you. And the kid's just like, oh, for fuck's sake, fuck you and your guilt trip. I'm not going to listen to this shit anymore. I'll deal with it on my own. Thanks, Mom. Um, that you'll find in a lot of particularly single-parent households. And what, what winds up going on is that the kid then realizes that they cannot be a burden to the family, they cannot, which means that they don't have a support system, which means that this will be picked up on by every one of the other kids in the schoolyard, who are then going to center in on that kid and, sent, and know that whatever they do, whatever kind of fucked up shit they do, whatever the wall they push them in, whatever teeth they knock out, that there are going to be no consequences for it. And the reason I bring this up is because people go into this, uh, these stages in adult life with this sense of learned victimhood. What I mean by learned victimhood is they feel bad. Like, oh, if only I was taller, I wouldn't be picked on by society. Oh, if only I wasn't as weird. Oh, if only I didn't, didn't listen to, to thrice in punk music. I watched the wrong TV shows. I was weird. I had a weird sounding voice. I did too well in school. That's why I'm not going to be successful. And as much as I believe in the sense of personal accountability and responsibility, as much as I believe in, in, in uh, taking responsibility for your success as well as your failures in life, as much as I believe in taking accountability for your success as well as your failures in life, I also believe that there is a certain age group where there is no sense of personal accountability. There's a certain age group where you cannot say it is you have to take responsibility for every single thing that has gone wrong in your life. And when a child is four years old, when a child is five or six years old, you cannot say that, oh, you're being... Stop bullying her. Stop bullying the other cat in the middle of the bullying video. Fucking asshole. He's 24 pounds, she's 11. So now he's going to do it off camera. Anyway, you cannot ask a six-year-old to take personal accountability and responsibility for the fact that his peers are treating him like shit. And what, I've, and what truly fucking kills me and, and what makes me just want to just throw shit at my television until it's, uh, is, is when I hear parents who have these kids that have been bullied, that have ha hung themselves, that have wound up in hospitals, that have slit their wrists go, I never knew that any of this was happening to little Billy. Little Billy was always such a good kid. I always thought he had a bull fucking shit. If you knew anything about your child, if you had focused on your child for even five seconds during the day, instead of being such a self-centered piece of crap, then you would know what was going on with your son or daughter. If you were not such a self-centered piece of shit that, de that cared more about your own comfort than the well-being of the child that you chose to bring into this world, and by the way, I am sick and fucking tired of hearing people say crap like, oh, it just happened. How'd you have a kid? Oh, you know, it just happened. Well, do you know how children are made? Yes. So, how'd it happen? I don't know. Well, did you allow a penis into your vagina? Yes. Was it wearing something on top of it? No. Then it didn't fucking just happen. But I digress. When you hear these individuals that just have no sense of the, fa of the responsibility that is required when bringing a life into the world, say things like, I had no idea. What you're saying is that you were such an awful parent, you were such a self-centered human being, that your child was able to instinctually pick up on this and understand that they needed to avoid talking to you. They could not bring up their issues with you. And Here's the thing, if you are a good parent and your child has been punched in the face or had his tooth knocked out or has, a, or, or has been laughed at by 30 people for 20 minutes, you're going to see a difference on his face when he comes home. But if you're that crappy parent that's like, how, how is your day while you're, switching the, while you're switching the channels on the TV or watching, your, or watching your fear factor or on the internet or texting on Facebook, whatever the fuck you're doing that's more important than shepherding a new life into the world, what you're going to, what you're going to do is that you're just going to ask that question, not pay attention. They're going to go off into their room with their misery. And this really bothers and this really triggers me, this, this complete lack of accountability and responsibility that we put onto the parents and that is further fostered by the terrible teachers that are in most of the public school system. One of the things that always used to kill me in the public school system is the complete lack of ability to investigate why something happened. Remember when you were in the schoolyard and some bully kept hitting you and he kept flicking you and he kept fucking with you and, he kept, and then he would finally do something like hit you really hard that would require that you hit back because if you didn't hit back you knew you were going to bleed, you knew you, you were going to fall into a fence, you knew that you were going to get tossed over or, or have your tooth knocked out. The moment that you hit back, then he, then he yells something, and then one of the, the, the schoolyard aides will come over and say, cut that out, you're both getting right up. And he's like, but he started. Nobody cares who started. 
Nobody cares to look. Nobody cares to investigate why that occurred. There is equal accountability and responsibility placed on both parties, even when one person is clearly the predator and the other person is clearly defending themselves. And that's because we live in a society that just, it doesn't put blame where it belongs. It doesn't put blame on the parents. It doesn't put blame on the individuals who volunteered and took the responsibility of bringing a life into the world when they don't, they don't even have the most basic idea of how to, of how to wear protection so that that doesn't happen if they're not ready to have a kid. If you don't want to have a kid, if you'd rather watch TV, if you'd rather text on Facebook, if you'd rather drink until 2 in the morning on Saturday night, that's totally fine. More power to you. But there are things that you can put. There are things that you can put on and there are things you can take to ensure that while you're in that stage of your life that you don't bring a child into it. And I'm sick and tired of not seeing accountability or responsibility put on the family. In the schoolyard, in the classroom, it's the bully and the bullied that receive equal credit for starting the argument. They receive equal credit for starting the fight. They receive equal marks off on their, um, on their, um, what's the word I'm looking for? There's uh, all the things that you get graded on, and then there's the, like the how you act. It's, uh, I, the word will come to me once this wears off. But there's a word, conduct, yeah, conduct. You'll both get equal marks off of your conduct, even though you were defending yourself against a predator. Nobody decides to look into the issue, and then nobody decides, after they figured out who was the predator and who was the bullied and who was the victim, nobody decides to talk to the parents about it, and you will never hear a teacher talk to a parent and holds that parent responsible and accountable for the fact that their child is, su is, uh, is going to school with such anxiety, with such, isol with such isolation just, you know, just seeping out of their pores that people can just instinctually pick up on it as soon as early as six to seven years old. And so the question that I would have for all of the people who were bullied that are blaming themselves, for all the people who were bullied because they thought that they, they weren't wearing the right stuff, because they were weird, because they dressed funny, because they weren't good at kickball, because they were too smart, or because they gave the wrong answers in class, for all those people, here's my question. If you really look back objectively on your life, if you look back objectively on your childhood, were you made to feel like a burden by your family? Did you feel that you could go to your family with your problems, with your fears, with your feelings, with your emotions, with whatever it was you were facing in life, or did you feel like doing that would open a can of worms? And if you feel like going to your parents to talk about whatever it is that was going on in your day would have opened a can of worms, then why is it that you felt that way? Why is it that at four, five, six, eight, ten years old, why did you feel that sense that you could not speak to the two people who are responsible for creating you about something as basic as being picked on in school? Why is it that you felt that you needed to hide from your mother or your father that you were getting punched on the bus? And, the, and you know, you can come up with your own answer, but just because I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and answer it for you. You felt that way because you felt that you had to protect them. You felt that you had to shield these people whose job it was to shield you. And why is that? And my second question for you is why as an adult have you not had that conversation with your family? Why haven't you had to sit down with your mother or your father and discussed everything that occurred to you and say, why is it that you never talked to me about this? Why is it that you never picked up on the fact that I would come home with blood on my shirt? Why is it that you never picked up on the fact that I came home and I wouldn't want to talk to you for four days? Why is it that you wouldn't pick up on the fact that when I came home that I wasn't hungry for eight hours at a time? Why is it that you weren't there for me? Because that's, a di and the thing is, that's a difficult conversation to have because, because it's, it's, it's not going to end well. You're, you're often going to hear statements along the lines of, we tried the best that we could. We did the best that we could. Or couldn't you appreciate that? And I want you to think about any other area in the world, and this is one of the parts, the other parts that triggers me is when people say that, that, that being a parent is, 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 the, is the hardest job that there is. I will agree that it is a difficult job, but one of the things that kills me is the fact that it is one of the only jobs 
that you cannot be fired from. It is one of the only jobs that you cannot get a write-up in. It is very, very difficult to get, ta to get your kids taken away by child services. Again, you have to upload videos of yourself like Daddy05 taking your kids and beating them against a, a fucking dresser or a shelf or whatever it is until, and then having to hit the front page of Reddit two or three times before they finally visit. But it's one of these things where it's one of the only jobs that you cannot be fired from. It's one of the only jobs where you can be that terribly bad at it and still get by. So when I hear parents say, we did the best that we could, what I hear is we took advantage of the fact that our job is one of the few jobs on planet Earth where you cannot get fired. Of course, obviously, besides being a New York public school teacher. Uh, what other jobs can you not be fired from? If you work at my store and you break 10 phones in a row and you destroy their data and you keep putting the long screw into the short hole every single time, are you allowed to look at me and say, I tried the best that I could? If you were a cop and repeatedly on 10 separate occasions, you shoot your fellow police officers with friendly fire rather than shooting at, 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 the, uh, at the felon that is, that, is aim that is aimed at you, are you allowed to say, I tried the best that I could? No, you can't do that. If you cook food at a, at a restaurant like the Plaza Hotel, can you say, after burning 80 omelets in a row, and instead of delivering something that's yellow or orange, delivering a black carbon-looking thing to the table, can you then say, after delivering a burnt piece of shit to somebody who paid $150 for dinner, we tried the best that we could? No, you can't. But for some reason, that's considered completely acceptable when it comes to parenting. And nobody bats an eye when they hear a story of a child that has ended up in the hospital because they have attempted suicide Nobody bats an eye at the parent. They'll blame the video games. They'll blame Facebook. They'll blame Mortal Kombat for the violence. They'll blame shows on the internet. They'll blame, uh, oh, they'll blame Slipknot. Oh, Slipknot music. They talked about killing themselves, so the kid did it. Liquor Fund from Pepe the Frog. Thank you for your 296. They'll blame everything on the internet, but you know what they'll never blame? The people who took responsibility and accountability for the child that they brought into the world. That's, that's bullshit. So what I would suggest that you do if, is if you were bullied in that fashion, I want you to think really hard about why it is you never felt that you could have that connection with your parents. Why was it that you felt so isolated when you were supposed to have a mi minimum of one, typical average, maximum of two, people who were supposed to care for you, who were supposed to take accountability and responsibility for talking to you about your emotions and your feelings and asking you if you were the type of person that felt bad one day and didn't want to talk of beating it out of you, of course in a nonviolent way. Why is it that you f did not feel that you could talk to them? And think about it objectively. I don't want you to think about it in terms of they tried their best. I don't want you to think about it in terms of, um, oh, I'm supposed to respect them because they're my parents and all this bullshit crap that society and religion pushes on you. All the propaganda of blood is thicker than water. I want you to think of it, about it from an objective sense. Why is it that you felt that you could not talk with your family? And after you're done having that conversation with yourself, Maybe talk to your family, have a real conversation with them, and be open to the fact that they may not want to have the average small talk with you when it's done. Be open to the fact that they may not want to talk to you at all, that they may start accusing you of shit, and that they may say that, you know, you, 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 you're uh, saying that we should be responsible for choices that you made, or this, that, or the other. Be open to the fact that they're going to be defensive. But have the conversation, because the sooner you have that conversation, the sooner you can go on with the rest of your life without being a victim, and the sooner you can start building real relationships with the people around you where you can talk to them about your problems, you can talk to them about your emotions and fears, and have real friends that will take real action when you are in danger, the way that your parents were supposed to when you were younger. Because this does not end. This does not end when you turn 17 or 18. This ends when you choose to end it. It may end in terms of the schoolyard bullying, but then you'll have to deal with the grown-up bullying. You'll have to deal with the Department of Consumer Affairs. You'll have to deal with the IRS. You'll have to deal with the Department of Collections. You'll have to deal with the Department of Workman's Compensation, uh, the, or the Board of Workman's Compensation. You'll have to deal with your vendors. You'll have to deal with all different types of bullying. And if you are not equipped to have discussions with the people who are close to you in your life about that type of bullying when it occurs, then you are going to be the, pre then you are going to be the person that every predator in the world, and there are many predators around you are going to choose to beat into and chew into for the rest of your life. 
I want you to have the types of relationships around you where you walk into these situations, even if you're an introvert, even if you're weird, even if you're short, even if you wear funny stuff or talk weird, I want you to walk into these situations in life with the confidence of knowing that regardless of what goes on in that situation, that when you go back home or when you go back to whatever people it is you deal with in your life, that you can talk to them about it and they will be there to support you because you're open to talking about it. But you cannot have these relationships with anybody else in your life if you don't fix the problem that you had, or at the very least acknowledge the problems that may be fixable or unfixable that you have with the first two relationships that you have in your life, which are with your mother and your father. That being said, let's look at the chat and see what cancer is in there. Let's see. Is this going to be a drunk stream? I'm not drunk. I have water. Snapple. See? The best stuff on earth. You've an incredibly unresponsive facial expression to alcohol. I don't understand this statement. I don't understand if that's a compliment, an insult, an observation, a concern. Talk about your cat. Blackberry, come here, girl. Somebody wants to see you. Come here. It was a good kid. Somebody wants to talk to you. Can you believe that Eli the computer guy photoshopped you as a Nazi to get views on YouTube? Can you believe that Eli the computer guy photoshopped you as a Nazi to get views on YouTube? Oh, you're not a Nazi, are you, girl? I know you're not a Nazi. You're a good kid. All right. Adopting is retarded if you don't have any problems reproducing. And adopting's not always a bad decision. Uh, there again, you cannot, because that, that kid that, got, that you're adopting is a kid that may wind up growing up in a home that's much worse than yours. So if you have the ability to properly provide and properly educate and deal with the child, then you are stopping, you're potentially stopping one person from bec growing up in an environment that will make them into somebody who has social problems, somebody who's a criminal, somebody who uh, has uh, personality disorders. And there's also the issue of genetics. You may have genetic attributes that you do not wish to pass on to children, which I would say is not retarded, but it's simply uh, a selfless act. It would be selfish if you have any type of genetic defect to want to pass that on to a child. So adopting does make sense in many cases. Cat bully, someone says. Yep, cat bully. Is this the kick-ass Mac repair guy? No, this is the drunk idiot Mac repair guy that has to be at work at 10 tomorrow. Should we leave abandoned children created by shitty people to fend for themselves, or should we want to take them into our homes and show them what a real family looks like? Uh, again, I would say, I, I think adoption is, is generally a beautiful thing. Uh, this entire concept that, the, that parents must raise their own child, even if they are not emotionally, financially, or just ready for it, or not mature enough for it. That, uh, I feel like that does a lot of damage. There are a lot of people that have genuinely quality family units. They are mature, they are stable, they, they, ha they are filled with self-knowledge, and they would make great parents, except for the fact that they may have some type of medical issue that keeps them from reproducing, that could adopt a child and give him or her an amazing life. Or it could go to the individual that had it, while wasted, while deciding not to use a condom, and it could turn into, well, you see crime statistics. First step to join a cult is to abandon your family. You're correct. The first step to joining a cult is often, uh, it, the first step to joining a cult is leaving your family. But I wouldn't say that that necessarily means that leaving your family is always a bad thing to do. I mean, you know, the first step to getting shot is to walk outside. Doesn't mean I'm gonna stop walking outside. There are a lot of times where it, you can have these conversations back and forth with your family, and if you never come to a resolution, 
You could either lie to them your entire life, resent them your entire life, have them berate you your entire life, or just move on to people that you chose. I would always go with people that I chose to have in my life over people that were forced on me, but that's just me. You talk tech and how it allows for more effective bullying. Huh. Well, I guess with the expectation that now you, get, you are online all the time and that you have a device in your pocket where people can tag you and notify you all the time, it used to be that the bullying would end when you got home from school. Now, you get home from school, and as long as you have the device in your pocket, as long as people know your social media handle, it continues. Other than that, I can't really say. But it may, and the other, I guess the other part is that Whatever, humili whatever humiliation that you endure can be recorded. You know, when I, when I was in seventh grade, I mean, I'm sure that they had some type of device that could do portable recording that cost like $1,000, that was huge, that you couldn't hide. But now it's socially acceptable to have this tiny, teeny little $100 device that can immediately record everything and put it online. So the fact that whatever stupid crap you do as a kid, whatever uh, thing you do that caused you to get picked on can be recorded and shared, that is damaging. Even if it's removed instantly, it's still, everybody saw it, everybody had a chance to save it. What are your thoughts on current cyberbullying laws? Uh, that's a good question that deserves somebody who's actually qualified to answer it. Because I, I, to be honest, I know nothing about current cyberbullying laws. I know like zero about current cyberbullying laws. So if you could tell me what some of the cyberbullying laws are, preferably in the Twitch chat, because the YouTube one keeps disappearing. If you could tell me about those laws in the Twitch chat, then I will, I'll uh, respond. Can you talk about how bullshit cyberbullying is? Well, I mean, there's a difference between people that can take a joke and cyberbullying. It's just, it's really hard to put where that line is. Yeah, I, I, it's hard to say where that line is. Problem kids are given all the credit for a schoolyard fight, even in the event of bullying. Uh, oh, geez. Internet. Hello, Internet. Mother. Eh? Uh, let's try. Oh, seriously? Okay, there we go. Fixed. Internet fixed. All right, that down at two megabit a second. This is optimum online. I can't hate it too much. It's only like 75 bucks a month. It's when I pay $400 a month for internet that I will complain about. It. But at 65 bucks, I don't expect to get more than 10 minutes of streaming in. Uh, so what was the comment that I just read? Ah, the one about, I read the comment about the problem child receiving the credit even when he was bullied. It's because the adults will pick up on the same aspect of that chi problem child that the bullies will pick up on. So the bullies, which are the predators, are picking up on the fact that that child is isolated from the world and is not likely to tell his parents or other people, his or her parents, that this bullying occurred. The same way that the teacher is going to pick up on that and go, 
if I pick, if I pick this strong child who has a strong relationship with their parents and say, he was causing crap and sent him to the principal's office, he's going to tell the full story to his parents, his parents are going to be supportive, they're going to come to the school and complain to the AP about my behavior, and then I'll get a write-up. Whereas if I blame the problem child, the problem child is going to go home, the problem child is going to have the alcoholic parent, the, al he's the problem child is not going to feel that they can describe what I did to the alcoholic parent, so hey, I can blame the problem child and no consequences towards me. I've seen that many times, and I have seen many cases of teachers blaming the problem child, and they may not go through that whole thing in their head, but it's the same instinctual thing. Internet fun switch to Comcast. Yeah, internet sucks. It's that same instinctual thing. It's that same idea that the teacher is picking up on the same thing that the bully is picking up on, which is they're going to have less pushback against the uh, less consequences for the results of their actions if they output the, if they have if they uh, take those actions against the problem child versus the regular kid quote regular kid uh. this guy talks a lot it is a talk show. Surprise, surprise. Have you watched or read 13 Reasons? Why? No, I haven't. What would you say to the parents of the bully who do nothing to stop the bullying at home? Well, that's a good one. Because here's the thing. I don't know what it is about children, but those kids who are bullies to the problem child, they will be great. A lot of the times, they'll be good kids at home. They'll be good kids to their teachers. They'll be good kids at soccer practice. They'll be good kids at tutoring. But then, but there's this something inside of their head. They'll be good kids even when they get a job as an adult, but they won't be good kids when they're dealing with the problem child and they see an easy way to let out uh, the bullying. What I would say to the parents is that you should have talks with your child about how it would be if the shoe was on the other foot and really get them to role play it. And if they can, and I guess I would start with role playing, like have them genuinely understand what it would be like to feel the way that the person that you, that's getting picked on feels. But also, why is it that they feel the need to boost their own confidence through bullying? What is it about their environment that is causing them to feel that they have to be a predator in order to feel fulfilled? Lewis will one day write a book called Long Screw Short Hold. How can teachers not be fired? Never understood this. It started around the 70s. It started around the 70s. It's the violence in the media, fucking idiots. I agree. The people that blame violence in the media rather than blaming the family, that, that's where it belongs. I see that you haven't thrown out that ass rock motherboard yet. Yeah, I should. I should. I don't have e-ways pickup at home. I got a Samsung TV there I need to throw away as well. That thing has been there forever. Ass rock makes some terrible motherboards, but it's my fault. I, I purchased a motherboard made by a company called ass rock. So, I mean, is it ass rock? Is it their fault or is it my fault for buying something that says ass rock on the box? and expecting it to be a complicated piece of technology that works.
Have you framed the Pepe picture yet? Not yet. What is wrong with the ass rock board? Randomly boots to nothing. Randomly doesn't post. Yet to meet a bully who is a son or daughter of a community empowered parent who's been nice. Most think themselves above others. I agree with mobile fix there. Puh. Blackberry! Come on, I turned on the air conditioner. Stop shedding. Puh. Black cat, white shirt. Bad fashion decision. What other comments have I missed? What I mean is, let's say a kid is a bully at school and gets caught, and when they get home, the parents do nothing except blame the school. Well, that's, again, that's the concept of... Blackberry. Blackberry girl. That's the microphone. Don't touch the microphone, Blackberry. That's the whole concept, again, of lack of personal accountability and responsibility on the parents' part. It was, it was what's on the TV. It was on the... Um, it, was, it, it was Mortal Kombat. It was reality TV. It was social media not having filters on it. It's always a pleasure to listen to you speak on these topics as well as do repairs. Many people say you're an inspiring individual. I don't think I deserve more than 10 bucks. I don't even think I deserve to be able to finish the bottle. But I thank you anyway. But yeah, the, the sense of lack of personal accountability or responsibility. I, it's not my responsibility to have to talk to my kid more than while I'm watching TV or fucking with my phone say, hope you had a good day at school. It's not their responsibility. The same way it's the school's responsibility. It must be the school. It can't be that I am doing a poor job of raising my own child. And the ultimate, the ultimate way that you can tell that somebody lacks a sense of personal accountability or responsibility is if you ask them how it is they came to have a child when they were not planning to have a child and they say it just happened. When someone says it just happened, that is the best indicator that they have no sense of accountability or responsibility because they refuse to acknowledge that they know how birth works. How the unicorn is cyberbullying real, just walk away from the screen like flowers close to your eyes. Eh, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not easy. So let's say you're on Facebook, and let's say you use Facebook as a platform, and let's say every, oh, not even Facebook, let's say you're on YouTube, because YouTube is actually this is the platform I have experience with. For, so I read through my comment section on a regular basis. I want to read my comments, I want to respond to all the comments that I get, because I like engaging with my audience. It's a part of the, f God damn it, too many of these in quick succession. I can't answer all these at the same time. Anyway, how do you suggest we change it as a society? Uh, I forget what your original question was, but I actually forget what the previous question was. Crap. You guys are tricking me just because I was drinking. So where was the uh, last one? Ah, I forget where I was. Blackberry, what was the last question before the screen made a noise? It was the lack of... Yeah, I genuinely forget where I was. Let's see. Can I rewind? Can I hear what I was talking about a second ago? What was I talking? Ah, here we go, YouTube. What was I talking about 40 seconds ago? Ah, cyberbullying. Yeah, so cyberbullying. So I want to read through my comments. I want to, I, I want to respond to all, engage with my audience that was actually interested enough to listen to all this crap. And then I'll just be like, rant, and I want to read it. Now, even if I block people, even if I block people that are just spamming or just saying crap, and I usually report spam anything that's not productive or contributing to the conversation. Like, you can disagree with me, you can think I'm totally wrong, and if you explain why, great. If it's like, cuck, LOL, I just, you know, report spam, it's just garbage. But you, you, in order to do the block, you have to read that, so if you want to use a platform, and you want to read all that shit, even if you block all those people, it's, it's going to take a toll on you after a while, which is why I would not suggest platforms like this for people who don't have a thick skin. I have a thick skin. I may respond to things I disagree with, and people will often take that as, you have a thin skin because you let it get to you. It didn't get to me. I just felt like responding to something that was a, uh, because I could, I could get a good lesson across by using it as an example. But you have to have a thick skin to use a lot of these platforms because you're going to read through just paragraphs and after paragraphs of hate and blah, blah, blah. And you see it, like 
PewDiePie releases the hate comments. Eli releases his hate comments. Uh, some of the fitness YouTubers go through their hate comments. Uh, and, and you, like Linus, I think one time went through hate comments. And you'll see that there's, there's, there's a lot of hate comments coming from a lot of people. And hell, sometimes even I'm, a, I, I'm, um, I'm guilty of being a part of that. But yeah, so it, it's not a thing in terms of like, it's not as bad as being forced to be in a room with people who are about to beat the crap out of you. Because you know, like when, you're, when you're in a room in second grade and there are kids that are just trying to push you off the chair while the teacher's not looking, you can't leave that room because if you leave that room, you fail. Whereas with cyberbullying, you technically have the choice of just, of leaving the platform. But, so it's, it's not as, it's not as cut and dry. It's definitely not, it's, I would not say it as bad as real bullying. Now the parts that are as, wor as bad or worse than real bullying is outrage culture. And one of the examples I'm gonna bring up that a lot of people are gonna hate me for, a lot of people are gonna say this is fucked up, was, uh, no, no, I'm gonna finish my damn thought. I will finish my thought. I'm sorry, Blackberry, I didn't mean to hit you in the head. I'm not, I'm not, no, we're not playing the game of I'm drinking every time you donate a dollar. That, that's, there's like, there's $260,000, there's 260 of you, 260,000 of you, and only like this much liver, so that's not happening. But there's the, for example, there was this one woman last year, and I'm getting getting a lot of shit for defending her here, but there was this one woman last year who took a picture of this naked fat woman in the shower at a gym. She meant to WhatsApp it to a single friend and go, oh my God, this is terrible, and insult that woman. And because she is an idiot, she wound up WhatsApping it publicly to the entire world, which then shamed her. Now, what she did was a terrible fucking thing. It was a terrible, terrible thing. You took a picture of somebody at a gym in the shower to insult what they look like. There are times in our life where we've, we've seen somebody that was 600 pounds walk by, and we've looked at our friend and went, you know, I'm not going to say I'm above it, and a lot of the people that are going to say they're above it are frankly bullshitting you, and just, they're just the white knights that want to pretend that they're better than everybody else. At one point in our life, we've laughed at somebody and laughed to our friend. Not saying it's right, I'm just saying that it happens. This person intended to do that to their friend. And again, is it petty? Yes. Is it stupid? Yes. Is it a fucked up thing to do? It absolutely is a fucked up thing to do. And they released it publicly. Now, after she accidentally released it publicly, it was picked up by Reddit, it was picked up by news sites, it was picked up by television news, and after it was picked up by all that shit, she was getting hate email, she was getting kill yourself tweets, kill yourself Instagram posts, kill yourself WhatsApp messages, kill yourself phone calls, uh, all this kind of shit. Now, the original thing that she did was fucked up. She released a, she, but, but you have to think about what the original intention was. The original intention was to make fun of somebody to one person. The result of that was her getting millions, millions of people bombarding her with kill yourself, fucking die, bitch, this, that, and the other. And don't, don't, don't get it twisted. It, it was her responsibility. It's her responsibility to not make that WhatsApp post public. That woman at the gym that was naked that had her picture shared to millions of people, that, was, that should have never happened. And she should be a fucking shamed of herself. I'm not saying that the person who took the picture was uh, doing anything good there, but the problem with cyberbullying is and if you have one or two or even five people fucking with you, that's one thing. But once this viral shit gets picked up, once this outrage culture ensues, that's the part that I don't like is when you've got millions and millions and millions of people spewing hate towards one individual, that will fuck with you. That will screw with your head. Now, whether or not they deserve it, I leave that up to you. I'm, I'm on the fence. I think that that woman that released that picture of the naked person in the locker room, she deserved a, f a decent amount of hate. But... Even I would say millions of people fucking with her like that, you know, it, it kind of hurts. But when you've got, but yeah, I would say that it's not, it's not necessarily cyber bullying that's the problem. I would say it's outrage culture that's the problem. And the, and the big issue here is when you combine outrage culture with, with a social justice warrior culture with tweeting cult with, with this whole concept where we get our news in 120 to 160 character sound bites. Heard a story where a guy in New York ran a red light and a nearby cop just looked at him and said, oh, wondering if that really happens here. That doesn't happen. The cop doesn't even say, oh, they don't even look at you. My uncle, who was a police officer back in the early 80s, actually gave somebody a ticket for, um, for, for crossing the street during a red light when there was a car coming that, had a, that had a stopped short to not hit him. And the guy actually complained to the chief, uh, not the chief or his supervisor or whatever, 
and said that this is discrimination, it's because he's white, and uh, this is discrimination because nobody else in Brooklyn has ever gotten a ticket because of this law. I know it. So that's discrimination against me, and my uncle actually got a reprimand for it, <laughs> and he never wrote a ticket for somebody who jaywalked again. Uh, he, learned his, he learned his fucking lesson there. But anyway, the problem with cyberbullying, I wouldn't say is necessarily cyberbullying. It's the combination of social justice warrior plus tweet culture plus outrage culture. We get our news in 120 character sound bites. We don't care for the context. We don't care for the history. We don't care for any of the background. We only care about the sound bite. We then take that sound bite. We then take that sound bite, and now we have outrage culture, which is we're gonna let, we have to fix this. And then you combine it with social justice warrior culture, which is looking for anything to be pissed at. What injustices are there? Like, what, what, like that, that, that person's eating a watermelon at work. That is a racist microaggression. Like, you combine that with outrage culture with the fact that we never look for the context of what's occurring. And you get into situations where it's very easily to have six million people telling somebody to go kill themselves for no good reason. So that, that's the part that gets me. Uh, good morning from London. It's not morning. It's still nighttime. It's still nighttime. Uh. And that's the cat. Twitch is dropping frames. Shitty internet. Not much I can do. Shitty, shitty internet. Let's say the kid is a bully at... Ah, I think I answered that one already. Can I have that Samsung TV? If you're in New York, sure. Just needs a new HDMI port. But it's 720p. And it weighs like 70 pounds. Probably like 70 or 90 pounds. And it makes a lot of heat. And it's 720p. She's going to court for, I think she said she meant to PM it after the fact. I don't think so, yeah, I don't think that somebody is retarded enough to actually take a picture of somebody naked at a gym and then shame them, like, w w set to public. I don't, I don't think, like, I don't think somebody is that, re let's see. Did you hear the, tra the tragedy of Darth Plagius the Wise? I probably butchered the pronunciation of that, but how the hell am I supposed to say that? I've never heard of that person. Your cats are getting mine excited. Seems like your cats need to be repaired. Have you gotten your cats repaired? Lewis just became Trump. I must have left my three billion in my other pants pocket. Too many people getting Twitter happy is what it sounds like. Easy for people to get angry at the littlest things. Come on, you know the watermelon thing is a straw man. Nope, that shit actually happens. <laughs> Possibility of doing a video on coil wine. Yeah. I'm not sure what I would do on coil wine. I'm all for fat shaming, but why I do it at the gym? That's low. I agree. That's why I, I'm okay with that person getting a certain amount of hate. But there's like, there's like a limit to the amount of hate. Like I would say the hate should fit the crime. Let the hate fit the crime to some extent.
Does Blackberry the cat run Windows 7? Absolutely not. She compiles Gentoo from scratch, from stage one tarball. How to repair the kitty. You should ask the ASPCA van about that. How much donation? Let's see. If you are fat, it is okay. Why feel ashamed for being fat? Uh, well, firstly, your decision to lead an unhealthy life is going to negatively affect the people who care about you when you, when you die. Um, the second is that in a society with increasingly socialized health care, you are then passing on the costs of treating you to other people who make positive decisions about their health and well-being. Am I going to walk up to people in the street and laugh at them? No. Am I going to say that if my best friend was 50 pounds overweight that I wouldn't suggest something because I care about them? I, I probably would suggest something. Let's see. Fat Logic is one of my favorite Reddit subgroups. Probably one of my favorite Reddit subgroups that I read before I even registered there. There's skinny people that are unhealthy as well. Yes, there are. That's called a bell curve. You just pointed out that the bell curve exists, so those points are moot. Oh, no, they're not. No, they're not. Somebody who's just be... Who, who is more unhealthy? A person who's, on, on average, Five foot six, 130. Take a sample of a thousand people. One thousand people that are five foot six, 130 pounds, or one thousand people five foot six, 330 pounds. If you were to take that sample of a thousand, because this is one of the things that kills me. It, this is almost. This is kind of like. Um, it's kind of like a, it's, a, it's like an IQ test. It's like do you, do you do you understand what a bell curve is? So if you take one thousand people that are five foot six, 130 pounds, and then you take one thousand people that are five foot six, 330 pounds. And then you had to gauge their health over the course of your life. Which group of people do you think would, on average, be more healthy? You cannot say that, look, eight of the thousand people who are in the 130-pound group are, are unhealthy. That means that weight has nothing. No, that's called a bell curve. That means that there is a bell curve, that some people will be here, and some will be here, and some will be here. But it's about averages. It's very easy to completely ignore statistics if you throw out the concept of a bell curve. It's like saying, I know a... It's like saying, like, I know a cat that doesn't eat mice when he sees them. That means that cats are not violent. No, it means that your cat is not violent. The other 90,000 cats would kill a mouse that ran by it if it was hungry. All right. Did you read the story about the girl who sued McDonald's because she was fat? No, I haven't because I like my blood pressure where it is. I like, I like having, like, my blood pressure the last time I took it was like 100 over 70. I like, having, I, like, I like having blood pressure that's not in the immediate heart attack range. And reading certain... Reading certain articles probably would raise my blood pressure. Need the TV recycled? Mail it to us. It's like when you say, like not, not to disenfranchise women, but when you say, on average, w men are stronger than women, and on average, men are more aggressive in um, dangerous environments, which are why there are more men in the army than women. But I know a woman that can bench more than, okay, yes. Yes, yes. I'm sure, I'm sure that Dana Lynn Bailey can bench press more than some of the dudes in my chat. That doesn't mean you ignore the average and the statistics over time. I, like, every time, so, I know somebody who's skinny and, and unhealthy. I know a woman that can bench press more than a man. 
I know somebody that didn't graduate, that never uh, graduated kindergarten, that had, that went on to start a billion dollar. Yes, yes, yes. Thoughts on the Daddy L Five witch hunt? I got no sympathy for that dude. I really don't. I mean, I don't, I don't hate him. It's just here's the thing. Oh, if you take away whether or not he hurt his children, if you take away whether it's staged or not, at the end of the day, that kid has to go to school. And when that kid goes to school, any of the silly, crappy shit that was done on video is going to be used to berate him. Because that's what kids do. They look for reasons to fuck with other children. So you're making money at the expense of your children's sanity. So if you take away the, whether or not they were yelling at the kids, if you take away whether or not that kid hit his head on the shelf or whether he just, that was just a sound effect that they added in as part of a fucking conspiracy. You take away all that, he, he's taking advantage of his kids for views and money on the internet. He's, he's not caring about the fact that when that kid goes to school, he has to get made fun of by other people for the fucked up shit that his parents have going on in those videos. And that's an incredibly selfish and fucked up thing, and I just don't have any sympathy for them at all. What is your workout routine if you have one? The first thing you do is you pick up the bottle. The second thing you do is you twist off the top, and then you drink. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it's something similar to the Strong Lifts 5x5, five five, except it's us I usually do three sets instead of five, and I added in some accessory movements for the lower back. Having a cat is a big no-no here in the mountains, killing the native wildlife and such. In the city, that's not an issue, as us human parasites have done that already. Now, in Brooklyn, the human parasites have not. No, there's still rats everywhere. Go to Bushwick. Get an apartment in Bushwick. I don't trust Lacey Green. Why wouldn't you trust Lacey Green? Everyone should trust what Lacey Green says. Everyone should trust Lacey Green. And if you believe that, it's time for another drink. Should I spend 17000 on the dip for J Nug and AMD? Eh. I, I don't want to give you advice on those two well. I don't, don't, don't make financial decisions based on... No. No. I would say wait for rail to dip to 12 bucks after a bunch of people short it, and then sell it once it hits 17 to 22 once the uh, infrastructure plan gets released. If that was a 70 versus 330 pound comparison, then it would be valid. Yes, skinny people can be unhealthy, but I want you to walk into an Arby's for me. Walk into an Arby's. Go to Brookfield, Wisconsin. Walk around. When you look, who, who do you see? Do, do you see a thousand anorexics, or do you see a thousand people that are, are going to that little wheelchairish thing at the Walmart because they don't want to walk to their fucking car? Which one do you see more of? Yes, it's kind of like this thing with single dads versus single moms. It's like, I mean, I may shit a little more on one than the other, but it's because the other is like an endangered species. I mean, I'm not going to say that anorexia and bulimia are not real. They are real and they are very unhealthy. But when you look at the, uh, at the numbers involved with each of the problems, we have a huge overweight problem with a capital Y. A little bit of anorexia and belief. like there's some, but the over oh my, the overweight problem is much larger. Lacey Green is an evil woman, says Awesomeus Maximus. We're gonna save that for another video. We're gonna save that for another video. You pro Second Amendment. My theory on the Second Amendment is the same as public restrooms. If you live someplace where the public can be trusted with public restrooms, if you live someplace where Chipotle does not have a lock with a code on the door that you have to type in to get in, then you're probably good for Second Amendment. If you live someplace like New York, or if you have a, play, a restaurant with a restroom that does not have a guard next to it to ensure that you bought something before going in, and you walk into that bathroom without a lock, and there are three people, you know, like selling drugs, uh, it's like setting up their mobile home there, then you may not be able to be trusted with guns. There are certain parts of the United States where people can be trusted to be good human beings. 
And then there are parts of the United States that bring out the worst in people that bring out the piece of garbage. And when you're in those areas, I probably wouldn't be as trust, trusting with guns as I would be in other areas. Like if I, if I was walking around Brookfield, Wisconsin, and I saw that people had guns, I would be okay with it. If I'm walking around, you know, like Brooklyn, if I'm walking around like, you know, Bed-Stuy, Bushwick, and I see a bunch of people with guns, I'm fucking hiding. It's... Lacey Green is misguided and is he a lot to her cause? No way! Uh, just, just, just don't spoil it for me, because that, that's coming up in a later video. We're going to be just... It's coming, trust me. They have guns, they just don't show them. Yeah, that's a good point. Being fat is okay totally just because you are three deviations heavier than average does not make you a worse human. It may not make you a worse human, but it most certainly makes you, in many cases, a less healthy human. Again, I am five foot six, I'm about 155 pounds, and for, for my height and for my, for my running routine and my weightlifting routine, that is acceptable. If I were five foot six and maybe 240 pounds, I would have to be honest with myself that that would not be as acceptable in terms of health. Uh, all right. Time to continue. I'm not going to give you like a, like a set of weights and a set of heights and say this is definitely unhealthy or healthy. It's just, but I mean, like, you're, you're going to know. You're going to know. You're, you're going to go outside and you're going to try to run a mile and you're either going to run the mile or you're going to drop, like, almost feel like you're going to drop dead. Like, it's, it's, it, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical health professional. All I'm saying is be honest with yourself. You're going to know when you've passed that point of, this was something I used to be able to do, and now I cannot. And I don't have a medical disorder. I don't have a disease. I don't have a broken bone. It's just because I've let myself go. You're, and everybody's going to have a different point for themselves as to where that is. It's just, it's important to be honest about it, because if you're not honest about it, you're not going to fix it. Like my dad just had his, uh, knee re his second knee replacement surgery recently. Uh, he's six foot tall, he's 68 years old, and he's 300 pounds. He's honest with himself. He, he, I talk to him on the phone, he's like, I am fucking fat. I am a fat ass fuck, and I need to fix this. And uh, can I send you a pallet of Grey Goose to the store and sponsor a drunk stream? Maybe get Jess involved as well. Uh, not a big Grey Goose fan, but I will try. I like Southern Comfort, I like Jägermeister, I like that Don Q coconut rum, even as umbrella-ish as it is. But yeah, like, when I spoke to him, he, he tells me, he's like, I know that I am a fat, he, he uses the word, fat fuck. And he's honest with himself. And over the past, uh, right after he got his knee replacement surgery, he's been doing his rehab, he's been doing his exercises every day, and he's gotten himself down to like 245 pounds. Still not perfect for his height, but that is an improvement. And the first step towards improvement is realizing, fuck, I, I don't know, I got myself into something with someplace I shouldn't be. All right. Do some moderate hating. What's wrong with Wisconsin? Nothing wrong with Wisconsin. My dad lives in Wisconsin. He moved there. He likes it a lot better than New York. I've never heard of locks in public restrooms. You do not live in New York, then. I can tell that you have not been in New York. And you're, and you're better for it. I'm not making fun of you. You are better for it. Why does my MacBook Pro 13-inch get so hot when I just watch a YouTube video? Because you chose, you made an active decision within a capitalist society to purchase a product with a crappy cooling system. And now you must live with it.
Running is heavy on the knees. If it's five, it is like five times shock when you run. If you're fat, you should not run. My dad speed walks. He stopped running about 30 years ago or so. But he does like, but he does do his speed walking. What do you think of you break I fix? I mean, they're your standard franchise, you know? It's like, fr franchises are always going to be a, a bottom of the barrel experience. Um, because in order to have a franchise, in order to have locations everywhere, you have to dumb down your routines in order for them to apply to the worst possible applicant, which, yeah, speaks for itself. Same thing with Chipotle or any kind of national chain. Like, you go to Chipotle, been open 20 years, cannot close a burrito to save their life. You could leave them a $10 tip, they cannot close the burrito so that when you pick it up, you can eat it without it falling apart. But then you go to a nice local place and you walk in and you ask for a burrito at the nice local place and they make you a burrito and you pick it up and you bite into it and it just it, it keeps its form when you go to like a good local repair place they know their shit they know that they can help you they know what to do they're not outsourcing shit and then you go to like the franchise and it's like okay sir let me read from my script okay sir let me find the price in the book wait 10 minutes while i find the price in the book for your model Okay, wait for the standard turnaround time because we have, like, you know, eh. Chipotle is horrible. Concurred. If you just moved to New York City and had only $2 million but no skills or contacts, how would you go about making a life here? Uh, that's for you. I don't drink Red Bull. Red Bull is disgusting. Red Bull is fucking gross. That, 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 that is, like, I've read the ingredients list of it, and no, I ain't, no, no. Like, I'll do this, like, once every three weeks. Actually, I, I drink even less than that. This is, like, the only bottle that I've bought in the past year. But, no, no Red Bull. Red Bull is where I draw the line. Can you send me the broken-ass rock board? I don't care if it's broken. I'm the one who won the capture card last month, by the way. Sure, just send me a reminder. It's all yours. If you can fix it, that's great. I don't, my policy, I don't fix my own shit. I do enough of that at work. If I'm going to work 8 or 12 hours a day fixing stuff, that's fine. When I get home, if it, if, it, if it breaks, I buy a new one. I give myself that luxury. A lot of Chipotle is horrible in the Twitch chat. Chipotle. Who should I contact you for a reminder? Carrier pigeon. Carrier pigeon will do. Tell Blackberry. What is your favorite Tori Amos song? Ooh. Baker Baker. Yeah, it's between Baker Baker, Jackie Strength from 2 minutes and 50 seconds, Crucify from 3 minutes and 30 seconds, or Not the Red Baron on Boys for Pele. That was, oh yeah, Not, not the Red Baron is probably, probably it. Not the Red Baron. It's between Not the Red Baron and, Boy, and, um, and Baker Baker. It's, it's a two-way tie between Baker Baker and Not the Red Baron. Tori Amos is amazing. Little Earthquakes got me through the hardest part of my life. It made me sad when she had the plastic surgery. I was really sad when Tori Amos had plastic surgery because what I, the vibe that I received from her music was, I don't care what you think of me. I don't care about your judgments. I don't care about life's adversity. I am me. I am, unapolo I am unapologetically an awesome person. And I don't care for your thoughts. I don't care for, for your put-downs. I am going to succeed anyway, and I'm going to laugh at you while doing it. So there was something about seeing her decide that I'm going to change my face I'm going to have surgery and have people cut, out my, cut around my face so that, I can, um, so, that, so, that I, so that I can look better to you that kind of seemed to undermine that theme from her music. I shouldn't judge. I really shouldn't. But there was something about figuring out that she had plastic surgery that made me sad. 
I never really, I never cared what she looked like. I'd listen to her music. I'd go to Tori Amos's concerts when she's 150 years old. All wrinkled up, tits by her ankles. I wouldn't care. I don't, get, I don't care what she looks like. I love Tori Amos. Do you repair logic boards as a side job? No. I repair logic boards as my main job. And filming them for YouTube is my side job. Look at Blackberry falling asleep. Hi, Blackberry. You're a good girl. She always has to be on camera. You may have, in some of the older videos I've done at home, she always finds a way to sneak her way into the camera area. Like she'll go just into the edge and she'll like, sometimes, maybe it's me, but I can see her looking at the TV to ensure that she's in the camera, that she's, to ensure that she's in the area. What was the hardest part in your life? The hardest part was when I was interning at Avatar for 40 hours a week and interning at Progressive Music for 40 hours a week while not getting paid uh, more than like my lunch and whatnot, while commuting from Staten Island to Manhattan. So it was, it was mostly to do with the uncertainty. It was the fact that I knew I was working 80 hours a week without any certainty that any of what I was learning would actually apply anywhere later in life. So it was knowing that all of this work may not have a light at the end of the tunnel. So it wasn't necessarily the work. It wasn't the cleaning the puke. It wasn't the, the carrying the heavy instrument cases. It wasn't the sitting in a room for nine hours in a crappy session. It wasn't uh, the, the stress of knowing that, uh, that, that Rich Costi or Al Schmidt or um, who's the guy that worked with uh, My Morning Jacket or Joe Ciccarelli or, or uh, Neil Dorfman were coming in in three hours and nothing worked. It wasn't even the stress of all that. It was just knowing that all that work and effort was being put in when there was no light at the end of the tunnel. So I'd be getting on to the, so I would, in order to get home from Manhattan at like three or four in the morning uh, to Staten Island, I would have to take a, um, I would have to take a train to a ferry, to a bus, to a one mile walk. So it was like a three or four mile walk. So it'd be like two or three in the morning and I would be fucking dead and I had to wake up again at seven in the morning. So I would start the three hour journey so that I could get home and sleep for 45 minutes before starting it all over again. And I would wonder, like, I would, what am I doing this for? Is this going anywhere? Is anything that I'm learning going to apply anywhere else? Will I ever uh, wind up making real money in life or be independent? And I'd have that Tori Amos Little Earthquakes album playing, in the, um, playing while I was walking to the train or walking home. And I and I, and I, and, uh, didn't feel that bad anymore. I like Little Earthquakes. That was a good album. That, that, Little Earthquakes is an amazing album. Let's see. Have you heard of Tina Arena? I've never heard of that person. I received the Amtec Flux. It is the best. It indeed is. It's way better than that ASM stuff that certain people will peddle. How do you feel about the Galaxy S8? I have zero compelling reason to move to an S8 from an S7. Honestly, is there really a compelling reason to move to an S7 from an S5? Like, is there any reason to get a new Android phone? Like, I know they show you all these cool features in the, um, in the review videos, but is your phone really so bad that you need to upgrade? Probably not. There's just no compelling reason to get new phones anymore, in my opinion. I don't care about the latest phone. I really don't. I know that that's the popular stuff. I know that if you want to get 3 million views on YouTube or you, you have to talk about how the new latest smartphone is so cool and how it compares to the others, but there is genuinely no compelling reason to get a new one. The only reason that I even upgraded from my Moto G to the, to the S7 is because I was running and I smashed the Moto G into the ground when I slipped and it stopped working. Like, there's just no compelling reason to buy new phones at this point. I mean, an, an S5 is liquid resistant. An S5 is a micro SD card slot, so if you need more storage, you just shove it in there. I mean, there's just, yeah. It's not like you can't play 1080p video on YouTube on an S5.
Sexy screen makes going from an S7 to an S8. Yeah, I mean, you can, like, just put the phone closer to your face, man, and turn up the brightness. Like, that's, that's the difference. All right, time to get out of here. It's long since I was done with my point. So that's it for today, and as always, hope you learned something.